Good morning, everyone, and welcome to activities for people living at home with dementia. <coughs> we are proud to offer this series with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way of Tarrant County. These programs are recorded and are made available for viewing through a YouTube channel for future use. I am your host for today's activities. Our topic today is brought to you by Peggy Spear with the Amon Carter Museum of American Art. And we're talking today about hats. <laughs> Sorry, everyone looks absolutely fabulous. I love it. Art, artful. The bird yeah. is tapping on my hat. Can you hear it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That might become irritating. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it could be, but he won't last for long. Peggy, take it away. All right, sister. Let me get it big. All right, can everyone see? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. All right, well, let's jump on into it. Our first image here <laughs> is by our good old friend, Charlie Russell. So let's talk about what we see. Cowboy. A cowboy. 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 And the a title gives it away. Hat. And a cowboy hat. <laughs> yes, Paulette and Phil, and we've got I think it looks like somebody who wants to get lung cancer is because he's going to make a cigarette. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he is, in fact, making a cigarette. And he is, in fact, wearing a cowboy yeah, hat. Yeah, making a cigarette. That's what it says. <laughs> yep. And so uh, what else do we see? So he's got in his hand, it looks like he's rolling the cigarette. He's got right. his hat on. What else do we notice that he's wearing? He's got his um, ready to Oh, he has a caps. Yeah, and he has a revolver. Belt, belt with a revolver. His gun. Yeah. Spur. Spur. You see it like a, oh, a he's bandana. Got his, his yeah. bandana. <clears throat> you notice his, what is on his feet? Spurs. 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 Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then this jingle? right here is Charlie Russell's signature. Oh, yeah. He would most of the time, not always, but typically he would add his little, um, his little house, his uh, house golf. Golf? Oh. Yeah. Kind of like his, um, how sometimes Japanese print artists would have a stamp to sign their signature. Mm -hmm. That would kind of be mm -hmm. a stamp on his, uh, on his, works on paper. So this is, we're, we're used to seeing, at least on the walls here at the Amon Carter, and we've looked at some in the past on paintings, we're used to seeing um, his paintings, but he was a really, really, really good draftsman, really good at drawing. And so um, he, we have so many of his, his sketches of ink on paper. And you kind of get, or what do you, what do you notice about the artist's hand in this? Does it look like he spent a lot of time on this? Does it look like he worked quickly? Does it look like he was um, using a thick, a thick nib, a nib or a skinny one? It looked like he was a uh, did this kind of quickly. And what makes you say that? Because all the lines are kind of scribbled on his clothes. The oh, outline looks good. Yeah. But it's still very detailed, you know. It is very detailed. Yeah. Belt has a lot of details. Lines go the same direction. Almost like a photograph. Photograph, yeah. Almost. Yeah, the, the black and white contributes to that that feeling. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but you get, I mean, you can really, you guys were able to point out so many features about this particular man. You can even see down to the pockets on his chat. Oh, that's true. Maybe it wasn't so quickly. <laughs> well, he was he was a quick quick draftsman, and he was so good at, at drawing that he probably he could have done it quickly, um, and he knew how to uh, to point out the details he wanted to point out. He wouldn't get kind of caught up, and he taught himself. He was never he didn't come out of the gate as good of a draftsman as he became to be. He got better and better over time. And our curator, um, excuse me, our conservator has done a lot of work on Charlie Russell's watercolors. So he was a better draftsman than he was painter. And the, and the painting came to him over Is time. he rolling a cigarette there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But so his hat, looking back at his at the hat, because that's what we're all here for today. This is, um, we have a, a archivist on staff who's a big hat buff. And so he was kind of walking me through this hat. 
This is a surplus 1876 hat, campaign hat, and the way it's gathered at the crown, so mm -hmm. up here, it's, mm -hmm. it's called the Montana Peak style. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh. and so um, Charlie Russell was an actual cowboy, um, so he was very intimately aware of fashion and function of this um, the cowboys, so he himself often wore these things or was working with people who had these on all the time. And so the Montana peak, um, he was really, he lived in Montana. So he was familiar with this. Um, so, so Peggy? Yeah. Um, uh, this may be off the subject a little bit, but I've, I've read the book, The Virginian, and I've watched yeah. the TV show, The Virginian. Mm -hmm. This does not look like The Virginian. <laughs> I, I, I don't know enough. So you, would, you probably are telling us more. Okay, well, it looks like he's from Montana for sure. Mm -hmm. I would and that, that makes not. sense within um, what's in Russell's background. But um, Remington also did a series of work related to the Virginia, I believe, as well. So I think our artistic liberty might have taken precedence here. And this particular hat style is actually the hat style that you still might see with. Um, Highway patrol, police patrol. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police use the same hat yep. style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If the crown were a little taller, it would look like Pharrell Williams's hat from Happy. Yes. <laughs> oh man, he's so cool. <laughs> well, you know that's he's kind of a. You know, this painting was well on well before uh, Pharrell. Uh, Pharrell was wearing <laughs> it, so I imagine it might be backwards compared. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh man, we, my mom and dad actually like uh, Pharrell growing. Like I remember listening to NERD in their car. It was really funny. Um, okay, so we've got our we've got this hat was mostly for function. Of course, there was style to it. You know how different people <coughs> would bend their hats that added a little personal flair to what they wore. But um, a cowboy. This is a standard hat um, that we still see today. So now. We're going to say goodbye to our, our friend rolling a cigarette. And we're going to move to this. Ooh. This oh very stern looking man. So oh, what is the hat on here? A hand trunk. Well, it's a military oh. officer. Yes. Um, Another Virginia. Oh, and Virg I heard someone say from Virginia. Yes. <laughs> it's an officer because he's got the shoulder board. <laughs> Good eye. Oh, no. And the sword. The um, enlisted usually did not have sword. Yes. Yeah. And, his, and his title, Colonel, is, is noted right. in the, um, the title of the artwork. What, what's the emblem on his hat? Well, thank you for asking, Yetta. His <laughs> hat is it's a, a silver bugle cap oh, badge. It, it's a bugle. And so it's silver, but the way we're seeing it is the reverse because this is a daguerreotype. And so daguerreotypes are on mirrors. Mm. And so often when you do a daguerreotype, you have something under your chin to quiet all of the noise to make it look like it's a, on a black background. So whenever we put daguerreotypes out in the galleries, we have these boards. You can, you can see because the mirror is reflecting in the back. Mm. Oh. So his hat is, it's a, um, I have it written down, a silver bugle cap badge type used by state militias. And in this case, um, like Martha said, it's Virginia. And so this, um, this probably would not have been worn in battle. This was, hat would have been helping, like um, Steve pointed out, all the other things he's wearing that help identify his rank. This hat would have helped identify his rank as well. Yeah, yeah. And so um, this particular photograph came to us in a, in a group of about 50 other photographs, 50 other daguerreotypes. And they're mostly from, not all, but a lot were from the U.S.-Mexican War. So mm -hmm. um, this was this, we don't know a lot about him. We don't know who even took the photograph, but we know that um, based on the other images, it's, I think Polk might have been in this of uh, uh, Photograph of Polk was in this series that um, came to the museum. And, and the age of it. 
And the what? Age. Yeah. The date. Yeah. And yeah. so it says with applied color, um, because eyes look kind of haunting. Mm -hmm. Maybe yes. that's to me. They look very um, piercing. That often um, with daguerreotype, you could go in and, and add some coloring to it, hand okay. color. And this is very tiny. This is only about three inches by two inches. Ooh. Oh, mm. that's impressive with the detail. Yeah. So yeah. the way that it would be um, printed or you know, agitated and everything allows for this um, very crisp detail. But then often daguerreotypes were kept in um, containers that almost folded like a business card book, you know? Mm -hmm. So you could open them up and prop them <coughs> off your, your dresser or you know, then they would, mm -hmm. because they were so fragile, they needed a bit of protection. So Peggy, <laughs> was this a, a one eight by 10, he got 20 wallet size? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he went to the school and they gave us the option of the laser background or the black <laughs> background, and he went with the black background. <laughs> That's cute. And you can see thumbprints, or, you know, from yeah. um, people touching the, the development fingerprints. <clears throat> but what do you think about this portrait? Well, it looks very serious. <laughs> very serious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ceremonial more than uh, work, working man, as someone said. He wouldn't have won this into battle. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Oh, I think they would have. Yeah. yeah. Officers wore these in battle. Yes, yeah. this identified him as an officer. Yeah. So and then. The, the data is actually the middle of the Mexican-American yes. War. Yes. Very middle. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. Oh, Steve, you are so smart, dude. He was, he was well, probably certain. Go Google, Google did well with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the, so did Mexican, you the American Mexican War was headed up by Andrew Jackson. Yes. And uh, he took the battle from uh, the U.S.-Texas border all the way down mm -hmm. into Mexico City. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so and, oh, and we did not have a standing army at that time. That's right. So we used a lot of volunteer groups like Virginia yeah. and other places. Even, the, even during the Civil War, the, most of the groups were volunteer groups yeah. exactly from, right. from states. So in this particular, in the 50 photographs that we received, there's um, some colonels from Maine that ended up in this series. Um, a lot of the photographs are from the American side of the U.S. America, U.S. Mexican War, but there, you know, there were some pictures in, the, in what we received, and we don't think it was the full collection of what these uh, dads right. were. Yeah. But um, there were some, uh, some, or mostly American scenes, mm -hmm. so that would suggest it was probably an American photographer versus a Mexican one. He has a sash on, and that usually was a specific color denoting his. Uh, regiment or detachment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it makes you wonder um, like why he didn't paint that particular color because you mm -hmm. feel a portrait of a military officer that would be that would mean a lot. Yeah. But these two, he looked very serious, um, Don pointed out. When the, this was very early on in photography, the sitter would have to stay very, very still. And so holding a smile, think of like when you're the first crusade. So often, I mean, and granted his position, his, his role of work would, would dictate a, a more serious face. But there, there were um, armatures and things like that where mm -hmm. you could sit in it and it would, you wouldn't uh, see the arms, but it would prop your arm a certain way. Right, like hold, your, hold your neck up and things like that. I think yeah. they did some. Yeah. So this, you can kind of see something behind his arm right here. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It could be he's sitting on the edge of a chair. We don't know, but those those devices existed to help um, steady the the sitter's uh, pose. Mm -hmm. So, Peggy, ask another question, please. The uh, the brim of his hat looks shiny, like his buttons, mm -hmm. made out of some sort of metal or something. Yeah, not yeah. I don't know enough about the specific specific make of the hat, but I would guess it could be um, even a like a a fabric with a patina to it, maybe like yeah. leather yeah. or... Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that, hats, I didn't bring mine out. I should have brought mine out to wear, but 
it's the same thing. It has, it's a shiny uh, brim, but it's not metal. It, it's a, uh, either a, a cloth or a, these days it's a plastic. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cover. okay. It's a, okay. almost like a patent leather. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ours yeah. were, ours were leather and we had to polish them with shoe polish. Right. Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. Thank <laughs> you, Bill. These days it's not as much, but those buttons, they basically actually even had little devices to put them around them to separate the cloth from the buttons so they could yeah. polish the buttons yeah. cool. without causing a problem with the cloth. Yeah. All right, so, so we're, we're leaving the military. This was a hat, kind of a function, not necessarily fashion. We're gonna say hello to Benjamin Franklin. Uh, hello, Benjamin. Uh, <laughs> uh, All right. So this hat is like as American as apple pie. What is the name mm -hmm. of this type of hat? It's a tricorn. Tricorn. Trifold. But it was not called, uh, called a tricorn when it was in fashion. It was actually called a cocked hat when it was in fashion. A what? A cocked hat. And it, it wasn't until the mid 1800s that they started calling this style of hat a tricorn. Okay. And so this hat, I, I, I grew up in um, Maryland and we always went down to Colonial Williamsburg for mm -hmm. vacation. I uh, love it. Anyway, the, um, they always had the tricorn hats on. And so this was, this hat was very fashionable during the colonial time, civil, in the um, Revolutionary War, forgetting my words. Um, and, and it would be worn by the aristocracy as much as it was worn by the common man. This hat was <coughs> everywhere in men's fashion. And so uh, it was made of, does anyone know what it, it's made out of? Leather? Not, no, not leather. Mm. Felt? Felt, yep. Oh, yeah, felt. A, a wool felt and so <coughs> a heavier wool in the winter and a, and a lighter wool in the, um, in the summer. Can you, can you guess maybe what time of year this? It's like fallish. Fall, oh. why do you say that? Because there's leaves on the ground. Have your, have your color. coat on. <coughs> the color of the leaves. Yes, the color yeah. of the leaves, of leaves on the ground, and he has a coat on. Man, you guys, nothing gets by you. And he's it eating was. an apple. And, and he's, he's actually he's eating a apple. roll, but it does look like an apple. You can oh. see he has a loaf of, or a roll under. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. And he has. And I think it looks like bread. Yeah. yeah, bread. Well, in his autobiography, Benjamin's autobiography, he identifies them as rolls. And so I'm going to read the exact ex excerpt from his autobiography that Wyeth was was capturing. I cannot read my handwriting, so I'm ad libbing. <laughs> <laughs> Having no room in pocket, walked off with a roll underneath each arm and eating the other. Uh, this, I went up Market Street as far as Fourth, passing by the door of Mr. Reed, my future wife's father, and she was standing at the door and saw me. Mm. Mm. So this is, it's titled The um, Arrival in Philadelphia. This is depicting the day he arrived in Philadelphia which um, we knew was in October. So you were right, it was fall. And we know um, historians have been able to really narrow it down <laughs> to October 6th, okay. 1723. No, we know who the lady is now too. Mm -hmm. yes. She's a future wife. wife. Mm -hmm. According to that, wasn't it? Yeah, yes. according to his excerpt. So, yeah. and he came down from Massachusetts um, and, and he looks as any other civilian would have looked. He's not in any military garb or anything like that. And so the tricorn hat too, um, it had, he's, he doesn't look like he's wearing a wig in this picture, in this painting, mm -hmm. but the way that the hat pinched would allow men to show off their new wigs. So you could see it was pulled in enough. You could see the fashion of their hair, which was really important. Um, it was also, so when they originally, it, this came from a Spanish and French design that made its way to the U.S. When, when men would stand with their, their musket or bayonet, it could stand and not hit the, the oh, side yeah. of their hat yeah. because it was pinched. 
And then the etiquette of the day is you would take your hat off the second you walked indoors. And so that right. those crooks in the hat allow it to go under the crook in your arm. Oh, okay. So it was fashion and function. And here it's very plain. There's nothing on his hat, which would make sense. He's traveling, he, you know, he's just trying to get where he's going. Um, but people would use these hats, men would use these hats to often align with political affiliation or for a special uh, celebration. They had things called cockades and it was almost kind of like a, a boutonniere for your hat, so to speak. And you would, certain colors would align you with certain political movements, mm -hmm. parties, mm -hmm. whatever. And like so a do-rag like do does today for... Uh, <laughs> for the yeah, I, I've us. seen pictures of French that have different, uh, those emblems on their hats. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes yeah. they were very simple. It could just be like a little black circle, ruffled circle with a silver pin in the middle just to, just to um, add a little zhuzh to their, their outfit. Yeah. And can you see what's right here on the on the stair? The it's a boot scraper. Boot scraper. Boot scraper. Do any of you have those at your house now? <laughs> no. no. We used to. Uh, used to. They were in my junior high. Oh, were they really? But they weren't that fancy. They were concrete and about three feet long. Oh. Uh, yeah. For lots of kids. <laughs> any place that was from the country always had them. Oh, really? Everybody's, yeah. you know, oh, country wow. or... Like growing up in North Dakota, they had them because the kids came in from the farms. So they'd wow. always scrape their boots, you know, before they came into the classroom. Yeah. So well, Peggy, oh, go ahead. Would you say that he's wearing some kind of stockings? Yeah, those would be petty, like a petticoat. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at his right foot, his stocking has a hole in it at the heel. Oh, look at oh, that. Oh, yeah, very wow. good. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Excellent. Good, and it good also looks like the left a leg. Very good eye. Yeah. Up, up closer to the knee, there's a hole in the sock. Right yeah. here. For sure. Right yep. Yeah. Well, that, that goes along with it. Looks like he has a hobo stick that he's carrying in his hand. <laughs> hey, it wasn't easy coming from Massachusetts down to Philly that time of, uh, of our history. Mm hmm. No. They, the didn't have, they didn't have black garbage bags back in that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Well, he's on his way to church. He's got his holy socks on. Holy socks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's never easy living in Massachusetts. No. Uh. So anyway, this this painting is on, I've been here for almost eight years now, and I've never actually seen this painting on view. Mm. So um there, I guess right before I started working here, it had recently been on view, and people love this this painting. But I'm not. My hunch is that there's some conservation concerns as to why we're not putting it up, but I'm not 100% sure. So while almost all of our oil on canvases are on view in the museum, this one is actually not. So you would not find it if you tried looking. Do you know how big it is? Um, let me see. Uh, you know what? I didn't write those dimensions okay. down. But it's rather it's it's pretty large. I would say by large, two, okay. High. Yeah, it's not it's not like a small one. Okay. Oh, good. And it's Peggy and everybody, thank you so much. I've got to jump off. Bye. All right. Another hey, meeting, see. But we will uh, see you folks see. tomorrow. It's 11 o'clock. Can I drop off? Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 All right. We've got another one coming at us. Oh. Ooh. Portrait of Mrs. R. So last week, we saw a portrait by Bellows of, of an older woman, and she had the lace neckline and, and mm -hmm. sleeves holding a cane. This is another one of the portraits he was painting during that same time up in uh, New York. What do we see? Uh, a woman. A woman. <laughs> I think she's... Um... Is, is, is it the first she's wearing? I think she's well off. I agree. Yes. And what makes you say it's a fur, Yetta? It just looks over the shoulders and just the way the thickness, the way it's falling. Yeah. yeah. And look at the detailing on her sleeve. Yeah. Oh, true. Oh, it, it's so detailed. It looks like a photograph. Yeah, he was very good draftsman. He was very good. And he, 
he did multiple studies leading up to this lithograph. And so this is again, um, the lithograph is done on a stone and he's drawing it onto a stone and then he's putting ink on it. And then there's a, a different printer would run the, um, the stone and the paper to, to transpose the image. So it looks very much by hand for an actual printing process. Yeah. All right, so we pointed out what looks like with the shawl neckline and the, the fur on the sleeve. What else do we notice about her? I can't tell what kind of hat she has on. I don't know what that hat's called. A cloche. A cloche. A cloche. A cloche. A cloche. Did, did anyone wear cloches in any of their fashion? No. Looks no. like it's out of the, mm -mm. the, roar, the uh, roaring 20s. Morning, Dusty. Yes, it was. It, this was done in the 20s, so yes, it was very much in vogue at that time. And um, that ha this hat was in style for a, a while, but this day and age, you, you never see anybody wearing a cloche. <coughs> and it, so it what felt is it made out of, Peggy? Typically felt, I believe. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And it kind of looks like <coughs> it's not for hair. It, it fits all the way on like a bell, kind of like when I'm a right. Show. Okay. And it was very tight um, along, you know, along with a little flare that's tight along the whole crown of the head. Now, this is a cloche with ears. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what Bellas would have thought if you sat down for your portrait with your little cat ears. <laughs> <laughs> we would have learned a lot about Martha if that was your hat and you chose to wear it. That's hair. right. Yes. <laughs> My mother used to be a hat model. You did call it? Yeah, she was a hat model. Oh, very cool. Do you have like a little witch's hat on? Have I not noticed this until now? She what? Our Paulette, are you wearing like a little witch hat? Yes. <laughs> I, love oh, it. I see it now, yeah. That yeah, Halloween perfect. baby. Yes. I want to be born on Halloween for no reason. I. That I wouldn't expect any other hat on you except that. No. <laughs> Nancy, were you going to say something? No. No? Okay. Yeah, please cut me off. No, I'm talking I don't know if she can hear you. Talking. All right, so what else? Yetta said that she, it seems that she's coming from a very uh, uh, higher socioeconomic situation, a you know, wealthier life. What else would indicate um, her... <laughs> Her, her life. She's wearing gloves. And she's yeah. wearing jewelry. Yeah, pearls or something. Mm -hmm. A chain. Yeah, it's probably pearls. I think you were right, Myra. And, and she's then, holding a handkerchief, a silk handkerchief. Christine Doshi. It looks, it, I think, yeah, it's either a handkerchief or it could be, I can't tell if she has one glove she's holding in her hand or if it's a handkerchief. Okay. But yes, she's holding something that is not, a, you know, it's more of an accessory <coughs> than a, a essential. And in other iterations of, um, of her portraiture, the chair is, this looks like a very simple chair. In other ones, she's sitting in, in larger armchairs that have, you know, look like it could be, a, or that, that Louis the 16th, that circle, you know, with the upholstery oh, yeah. and then the hardwood along the outside. <coughs> Again, the furniture kind of indicated her um, her higher status in um, in society, and so this particular Mrs. R, who's Mrs. R, uh, they identify her by her husband as um, is it Mr. Mrs. Walter Riker, and her husband was a collector of Bellows lithographs, so he did a. Portrait. What was her last name again, please? Riker, R I C H T E R. Okay. So this was, um, I don't, I couldn't find if it was commissioned by Walter or a, a thank you to Walter from um, Bellows as he bought a lot of his artwork prior. So All right, we got one more, and we'll kind of whip through it. This sweet little hubby. Oh. So what do we see? What's happening here? Picking cotton. cotton. Oh, cotton. cotton. Back home. Yeah. Picking cotton. What What does he have on his head? 
a big floppy hat. Any guess on what this hat was made out of? Straw. Straw. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to ask this little girl from Lubbock to explain all of that. <laughs> yeah, my husband's from Lubbock. Big <laughs> cotton farm. I used store. to live in Lubbock. I you, live in Lubbock. You a cotton farm? Did you ever pick cotton? What? Did you ever no, pick cotton? No, no but we drove by a bunch of them old cotton fields. No. <laughs> oh, <hi. laughs> is got an elevation of like 3,500 feet. So you just don't think of that when you're up in Lubbock. No. Mm -mm. I picked a nickel's worth once. <laughs> and so what did you do with it? Um, it was on my grandmother's farm. Cool. And I told my uncle who was uh, leading the pickers at the time that looked like fun. And he, here's, a, here's a sack, honey, you go pick it and I'll pay you the going rate. And I picked a nickel's worth. Oh. I got tired. <laughs> <laughs> and how much was that in volume? Probably not much for a seven-year-old. Well, <laughs> I'd say maybe maybe a loaf of bread. I don't remember. <laughs> well, so where, hey Martha, where did you grow up? Uh, that was in southeast Missouri. Southeast okay. Missouri. Uh -huh. Well, this little boy was probably younger than seven and didn't have a voice. And this was we've looked at. Um, Lewis Wick Hines photograph before of a little boy, two little boys working at a wood saw. Um, they were milling wood. On oh, yes, yes, yes. So this is this is the same photographer who was really collecting images um, to show how awful child work working conditions were. Hmm. And so this sweet little boy had no choice but to, to pick cotton. This was his job. And so um, he's got his little straw hat on. Which, just think of how sunburned his poor little skin would have been. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and so these these were used um, to present to the government as, a, as an argument for we cannot send our children this young to work. So, so Peggy, does this look a little bit staged? Because there's no other pickers around him. I, you know what? I don't know. In this series of pictures, there are sometimes other little boys all clustered together, other kids clustered okay. together. Um, he would definitely not have been working that land alone. Yeah, right. really. <laughs> Poor kid, if he is, geez. But um, in this particular photograph, this this little boy is the only subject. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don, if yeah. you look in the distance, kind of behind and to the left of him. Yeah. There's a white spot and then a taller dark spot. No, the other side. Right here. Okay. No, a little closer to right in there. There's two things that look like it could be figures of. What could it be? Could be bent over figures. You're right. I think they're actually cropped in this particular photograph. Oh. Um, but there are images like what Gail is saying, where you can see other pickers in the background. This particular boy, I feel like he photographed a lot of different pictures of him. He was of interest to um, Hines. So it would be surprising if there were just, that he has just one, a picture of one boy. Well, the rows were nice and straight, i say that. I mean, that bag is bigger than he is. It, it, That's it, yeah. So anyway, this, yeah, it's a straw hat um, and the, 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 Tighter the weave, the more expensive the hat would have been. So this looks like it actually is a pretty nice hat given the probably the poverty he was living in. But if that's what's protecting you from getting a sunburn or from yeah. that's completely destroying your face all the time and not seeing what you can do or seeing being able to see, I'm sure they spent good money on on protecting themselves. All right, well, those, those are our hats. Okay. Love that's it. A fun bunch as always. That's and I, again, I have no idea what I'm doing for you guys next week. I uh, well, I have it, but I don't remember off the top of my head. So I, I thought know. if we just advertise it as Peggy's surprise. <laughs> I love it. We'll you love it no matter what, Peggy. No, oh, of yeah. We will. Thanks for sticking with me, guys. Yeah, I, I can't remember what. I think it might be. I don't, I'm not even going to say because I don't know. Um, but yeah, I've got a theme picked out and we will enjoy it and 
I'll be on next week. All right, see you next week, baby. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Be good. You do a super job. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Miss Peggy. Round of applause. I love her hat. I do, too. (laughs) Yes. And tomorrow, we have Dave Parks, the owner of Home Care Assistance, to bring MindFit which is going to tickle our neurons and make us think in a fun way.